Hello, and welcome to the Studio Q Show. My name is Quinn Jacobson, and I'm going to talk to you today about two things. The first, the World Wet Plate Day, and developer. And we're going to make some developer, and I'm going to talk about some common problems. I don't know how deep I'll go into that in this podcast, but we'll start. Um, get some ideas about developer. With the summer coming up and some issues with developer in the summertime, I can address a couple of those kinds of things and show you a couple of different kind of what happens with developer and a couple of different um, mitigation um, procedures or, or ways to prevent um, developer issues from happening, so to speak. So first I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the World Wet Plate Day. This was, um, it's a kind of an interesting backstory. It started in 2009. I was living in Europe at the time and I'd been thinking for quite a while, at least a, two or three years um, since I'd been in Europe, about organizing something for Archer's grave. Now, Frederick Scott Archer, the inventor of this process, died in 1857, and he was buried in Kensal Green Cemetery in London, England, and he was, he was buried. There was a headstone there. They found a headstone as we, as we moved this process along. There was a headstone there. They found that as they cleared the plot out to do this, this uh, event that we held. But there was nothing really talking about his invention of the wet plate collodion process. And I'd been thinking about that for a while. And there were other, some other people that tried to do something with that, but um, nothing ever came about. And I thought since I was there and I had a pretty good uh, following in the collodion world, I, I figured I could get some help and organize something to, to put a placard or a stone on Archer's grave. So in 2009, um, we were talking about this on the collodion forum board. And one of the things that um, came up was, why don't we, because it happens around the same time, April, May every year, why don't we mimic the uh, Pinhole Day, the Worldwide Pinhole Day, and have a World Wet Plate Day? And I believe it was Mark Zimmerman, um, he's in Oklahoma, I think, came up with the idea, hey, let's do the Worldwide World Wet Plate Day and and have um, everyone make some plates in honor of Archer. And I, that, that's a great idea. Let's do that. So in 2009, there were, I don't know how many photographers, but I know there were 13 countries represented. I think we had, I want to say around 50, 55 images, something like that, that I selected out of that first year. And I put this book together. And all while we were doing this, I was thinking, and communicating, I was saying, we, I'll put this book together, we'll put it on Lulu, and we'll sell it. Uh, Lulu's a print-on-demand um, service for books. We'll sell it, raise some money, and see if we can do this um, Archer thing on May 1st, 2010, or the first weekend of May 2010, the following year. So I started in this in February of 2009. It literally took me over a year to put this together, and unfortunately we didn't raise I didn't raise the money all the money that was needed I think it was about I want to say about four or five thousand pounds total for everything British sterling pounds so that's a lot of US dollars and um, I got some donations we sold some books it didn't cover all of it and but then we had a show in the dissenters gallery at, at London there it is where he's buried we had an unveiling um, I asked Carl Radford in Glasgow, Scotland, and uh, John Brewer in the uh, Manchester area to come and be, you know, represent, if you will, um, a, a British, a UK citizens, um, and um, talk about Archer and that. I didn't want to, uh, I didn't want to be out front, so to speak, as an American doing that. And we didn't get much love from the UK. I'll be honest with you, we just didn't. It was. Uh, um, it was very political, I think. It was a very interesting um, deal there. The, the Royal Photographic Society and, and the BBC did a little tiny blog piece on us or something, um, if I recall correctly, but didn't get a lot of love. But we did have a lot of people show up. Uh, we did an unveiling, showed the, the plaque. I had a 20-inch by 24-inch uh, 
granite stone with hand carved, and it says, Here lies Frederick Scott Archer, 1813, 1857, a tailboard camera in there, and then the uh, um, the inventor of the wet plate clodian uh, process. So it was nice. It was a nice event. There were a lot of people there. I did some demonstrations. We held, uh, we had some food. It was a nice kind of opening celebration kind of thing. So that's kind of what started this whole World Wet Plate Day. It was, uh, it was in honor, and it still is, or it should be, in honor of Frederick Scott, Frederick Scott Archer, the inventor of the process. He doesn't get a lot of recognition, and I'm completely indebted to him. This, this process has uh, radically changed my life over the last um, decade plus, and it's been, a, it's been a, a, an interesting ride. And, and he didn't charge, he didn't patent it, he didn't charge anybody to use the process. He published the first working recipe in The uh, Chemist in 1851. And I know there's a lot of talk about um, Gustave Le Gray and Frederick Scott Archer, um, who really invented the process. Um, in hindsight and history, even even if Archer did use a lot of, of uh, Legray's material, in which I believe he did, he's the first one that, that published a working recipe. So kudos to him, credit to him, and I think it's a, it's a wonderful thing that he did. And I have my own personal theory about it. I think he did it to kind of spite Talbot. And it was interesting there at the ceremony in May of 2010 um, at Archer's graveside, the unveiling of his plaque. <laughs> Just not too far from there, there was a dead fox, um, a, a decomposing fox corpse lying on a, a tombstone. I made a play to that, and we called it the death of Fox Talbot. And it really kind of was. Um, Archer brought a close, really for all intents and purposes, the commercial aspect anyway, brought a close to the daguerreotype, the daguerreotype process and the talbotype or calotype process of paper negatives. Um, this replaced everything, So, and it was the staple for 50-plus years after that. So it's a very, very important piece of history, and I'm glad we were able to do that. So when you hear Collodian Collective or all those kinds of things, those were all things that happened surrounding the Archer event. And when I put that together, and Carl and John and I kind of organized everything, I had all the graphics done, and we had a night, like I said, we had a nice ceremony um, when you hear Collodian Collective, really it was, it was, that was the, the cause or the, the uh, impetus of, of creating that, so to speak, was the World Wet Plate Day came, the uh, Collodian Collective came along, and it was all based on unveiling and, and setting the record straight, if you will, on Archer's contribution to photography. So I wanted to tell you that in case you didn't know. Um, I'm very, very proud to have been a uh, uh, big part of that and played uh, a role in that, which um, while I lost um, financially, I gained in many, many other ways. I, I was going to go back and tell you, we had a show in the dissenters gallery. I think I had 33 pieces in there, 33 pieces, uh, plates, from individual artists and photographers all over the world. And, um, and if you're watching this and you were one of them, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, they donated their plate. Uh, Carl had them framed up in um, Glasgow, uh, brought them to London. We displayed them in the Descenders ga Gallery. We asked 250 pounds for each plate. So whatever currency you're dealing with, 250 U.S. dollars, 250 British sterling pounds, whatever, you get the idea, not much for an original Ambrotype plate. Um, I happened to do a negative using Archer's recipe, and I photographed some old... Um, monastery um, remains, if you will, stuff that Archer would probably like to photograph. I At least I would think he would. And I made an albumin print, had the negative, made a salt print, and I had the negative in the center and an albumin print on the right side of it. So that was a, a, dip, a triptych. But uh, most other people made um, positives. And 250 pounds, you could come in, buy a plate, and moreover, support the effort. We we're trying to raise the money for uh, the, the Kensal Green fees, the placard fee. The plaque was, I think, I want to say around 3,000 pounds, if I remember correctly. And just all the ancillary costs of doing everything. 
And unfortunately, like I said earlier, unfortunately, we had zero sales. There was no love, no support there to to bring this kind of thing together. It was it. You know, that part of it was very disappointing to me as I look back on it. There should have been um, there should have been a lot more love, a lot more love, especially in his own country, in his own city. I was it kind of changed my mind about um certain places and and people so um regardless it was wonderful it's there if you're ever in london and you're, you visit kensal green you'll see the plaque we put down there it's what you'll walk by you'll see is stone you'll see the plaque it's wonderful uh, very very happy and, and proud and honored to have been a part of that so um and i ended up um footing the bill so to speak i paid the bills and and the beauty of all that was that i ended up with the entire photographic show so there are worse things that can happen right we'll see what what goes on with that maybe in 20 or 30 years i'll if i'm still around i'll i'll have an exhibition of it somewhere it'll it'll be interesting down the road so that's world wet plate day i hope you participate in it today i hope you're um, out making plates or whenever you watch this i i hope you uh, i wish you good light and um and honor that man we we need to keep him in our minds and and be be grateful and thankful that he did what he did so a nice little throwback to that so the second thing i want to uh, want to talk to you about is developer and like i said since we have summer coming fast at us now, the temps are going to rise and the problems with developer um, are going to start happening. And I want to I want to walk you through a little bit about how I make developer and what the components or what the ingredients, if you will, the chemistry in the developer, the roles they play. And um, I think you, I hope you'll get something out of this. We'll see. Put some gloves on here. So, if you have my book, open up to uh, chapter 5, which is, starts on page 49. And the developer's in order. So, it, or the developer, the book is laid out how the process is executed. So you, if you're using glass, the first thing is cleaner, then it's collodion, then it's silver, then it's developer. So on page 56, um, you'll read, there's a couple of different, actually, let's start on page 55. There's a couple of different recipes you can use, or not recipes, um, well, there are, but different contents you can use in the recipes. And I'm going to start out by talking to you about what happens to developer over time first of all so here I have a couple of uh, developers in various stages of oxidation so this one's uh, fairly new I don't know a couple of weeks maybe I'm not sure this one however is at least I want to say a year and a half it might be a little bit 18 19 20 months maybe that's that's how old that is very red very oxidized but guess what it'll still work and we can try that if we want I'll, I'll show that to you maybe um, if not today another time for sure and then so so basically what I want to talk to you about was the oxidation process why is it what is that why does it turn red what why does all what is all this chemistry or seemingly so all of it change colors and turn usually red or get darker those kinds of things that's basically what what's happening here is the iron the ferrous sulfate in the developer oxidizing breaking down and oxidizing that's that's all it is so it starts out and you'll see what color it is here in a second it starts out kind of a a lime green uh, very pale color this is just 500 mils of water we're going to start with that i just put 500 mils of distilled water I've got another 500 mils here of distilled water to pour in after we make it to make a full one liter um, working developer solution. Let's talk about what's in the developer. The first thing and the most important thing is the um, ferrous sulfate. This is heptahydrate ferrous sulfate. That means it's got an extra water molecule in it on it. 
in it. Smells kind of sweet. And this doesn't require any filtering like the old stuff. You might be so new to collodion you don't even um, know what the um, old stuff is. The old stuff was this very dirty um, iron, kind of like the varnish if you use gum sandarac, you know, the bugs and the bark and the, and the resin. This old iron, fer this old ferrous sulfate has little chips of iron and pieces, I mean, literally um, the material in it. And so it kind of hangs in the solution and you have to filter it a lot. It was, it was a pain. But this heptahydrate, um, I got turned on to this in Barcelona a few years ago and I've never looked back. It's really good. Mix it, use it, no problem. So that's for ferrous sulfate, or you'll hear me call it iron a lot. Glacial acidic acid. Um, this is, um, I want to make sure that this is um, glacial acidic acid, not acidic acid. So there's a difference in, there's a difference in um, glacial acidic acid, acidic acid, and vinegar. And even in vinegar, there's pickling vinegar, household vinegar, all those um, different acids have different content uh, percentages of acid in them so household vinegar i think has three to four percent acid you can use household vinegar in it if you substitute it for the water and i've got a recipe on page uh, 50 56 actually positive developer with white vinegar and sugar um, the first one on page 55 is with a standard glacial acidic acid that's 99 percent Acidic acid is, is usually 28 to 33, 30%, something like that. Pickling vinegar, or um, pickle vinegar, is about 10 to 12%. Like I said, household is around 4 to 5%. So you need, an acid in, you need an acid in the developer. You have the water, distilled water is the carrier. And then um, finally you have the grain alcohol. And that's what's, that's what's in developer. So let's talk about each of these real quickly. And we'll set them to the side as we talk about them. Distilled water, the carrier, obviously. That's what the solution's mixed in. Ferrous sulfate, iron, heptahydrate iron. This is the critical component of the developer. This is the reducer. This reduces the silver iodine and silver bromine to the pure metallic state of silver. That's why your images... Like we talked last time or the time before, that's why your images will tarnish. They're, the highlights and midtones and stuff are silver, pure metallic silver. That's what the iron does, the ferrous sulfate. It reduces those halogens into the pure metallic state of silver. Uh, glacial acidic acid or vinegar or um, acidic acid, uh, sugar, um, honey. All of these are called restrainers. There are chemical restrainers and there are organic restrainers. Chemical restrainers are vinegar, pickling vinegar, acidic acid, glacial acidic acid. Organic restrainers are sugar, honey, molasses, those kinds of things. Um, one, act, one acts physically and the other one acts chemically, basically. And we'll leave it at that for right now. I'm not going to go into too much detail on that and trip out on that. Um, the restrainer, the acid, acts as a restrainer. And what, what does a restrainer do, photographically speaking? When you pour the developer on the plate, that action of redu reducing or bringing the uh, halogens to the pure metallic state of silver requires time. That's what the acid gives you, or the restrainer gives you, is time. It gives you time to bring the latent image up and in fully without developing any of the unexposed or any of the rest of the free silver on the plate or exposed silver on the plate. So when you're out in the field and you develop a plate, and that's why it's really, really, um, I'm a real stickler on time. You know, 10 to 15 seconds, everything should be in and you should be pouring water on it. This 20, 30 seconds, you know, cut developer, okay, we're going to talk about that in a little while. I can, I can understand that. But my recipes, my times, those things are strict. And, and the reason is that when you pour that developer on that plate and that image starts to come up or, or the, the halogens are reducing the pure metallic state of silver, you want to be able to 
visually see and arrest that development when those shadow areas start to appear because it still develops a little bit after even you're pouring the water on. So if you don't do that, so if your image is underexposed and you push that and you push it and you push it, oh, here comes the image, 10, 12 seconds, just the highlights start to come in, your image is way underexposed. And I guarantee you, and especially in the summertime or the warm weather, I guarantee you, you're going to have to wipe veiling off with a cotton ball on that. You're going to, you're going to develop that unexposed silver for sure when you go that long. Now, the, the other way around that is is to cut your developer in half with distilled water and you can extend the developing time. I don't like that. Some people do, to each his own, have at it. I don't like it. I like to get in there, punch that image up in the proper time. The color is good. The contrast is good. The tone is good. And if you do it right, you'll have the perfect image, right? It's, it's, a, it's a sequence and a methodology that you have to follow and a little bit of a rhythm you have to get into. Very important, restrainer. Iron, reduct, the reduction of silver, uh, the halogens, uh, um, glacial acidic acid, or, or the restrainer, some type of restrainer to hold back so you can develop your image. And alcohol, grain alcohol, ethanol, that is added as, um, as a, an enabler, if you will, for viscosity. So when you pour the developer on it'll cover the plate evenly and quickly without hesitation if you don't have alcohol and if you have a fresh silver bath you don't need to put alcohol in your developer that's just the way it is once your bath starts getting filled up with solvents your plates gonna come in it's gonna be very resistant to the developer if you don't have alcohol in your developer it's gonna stop it's gonna kinda bubble it's not gonna it's not gonna flow sorry about that it's not gonna flow over the plate like it should so alcohol allows it to flow evenly and freely. And if it stops and starts and stops and starts, or you miss pieces of it, those are called developer sweeps when it starts and stops. And then developer islands, wherever it doesn't get, it, when it pools around and no developer gets in a certain area, and you have a big black hole. Sometimes they're collodion islands if you do a short pour on collodion. But most of the time it's developer. That's what alcohol does. It allows the, the, the developer to flow over the plate evenly and smoothly. So there you have it. Water the carrier. Iron the reducer. Acid the restrainer. And alcohol for viscosity or flow. So let's make, let's finish this batch of developer off. And you'll see how I kind of go about, about it here. Um, I just have a little cup here for the iron and my scale is zeroed out. I'm going to make a one full liter. So I put, this is really important, I put 500 mils of water or so in there, half full, so to speak, of distilled water. I'm going to put 40 grams of ferrous sulfate in this little cup. 35. 38, there we go, 40 grams of ferrous sulfate, there, put my, turn my scale off, set it over here out of the way, maybe over here. It's very important that you put the ferrous sulfate or dissolve the ferrous sulfate first in just the distilled water. So I use a little funnel here so I don't complicate things and I'll fill the funnel up take a little bit of the distilled water. I don't like to use a glass rod or any this this stuff will just dissolve right away and go right down in there just like that. Pour the rest of it in. A little bit of help with some distilled water there it is. So there's our ferrous sulfate. Shake it until it's dissolved. This has got so much latitude that you can literally, I've literally just made this on the fly without measuring or doing anything, just guessing. I've made so much of it. So that's kind of what it looks like, um, uh, relatively good facsimile of the color, 
versus new versus really old. You can kind of see the color difference there for sure, right? Oxidized, non-oxidized. Next, we'll take a graduate and we'll put um, some glacial acidic acid in here. And I'm going to go, since it's getting warmer, it's um, 80, I think it's 82 degrees here today in Denver. That would be about 20, 26, 27 Celsius, 28 Celsius, something like that. So it's warming up. In the, in the summertime, you definitely want more glacial acidic acid than in the wintertime. Everything's exacerbated with heat, so everything on that level is moving a lot faster than in the cold. So I'm going to do 45 milliliters of glacial acidic acid, and I'm going to do, um, I'll do 50 mils of, of uh, alcohol. Put that together. That gives me, and the bigger the plate you're doing, I recommend more of the alcohol and the acid really and you'll have to experiment a little bit but basically pour it in well, I can leave that funnel in and then top it off with water distilled water when I say water I you know I always mean distilled water there we go Fresh batch of developer, ready to, ready to use right now. Really simple, really easy, really quick to do. What I encourage you to do is utilize um, this knowledge, understanding what, you, what each component does, and play around with the acidic acid or the, the restrainer, and play around with the alcohol. And so until you get a good plate, develops properly in the, the right amount of time with the right exposure and you don't get any veiling or scumming or any of that stuff that you have to wipe off with a cotton ball. Um, play around with those two things until the, the developer flows smoothly over the plate and you don't get any uh, veiling or scumming. Those are the two biggest things. So having said that, I usually in the summertime, I'll add 20 to 50 percent more uh, restrainer, depending on how much uh, what the heat is, and also alcohol. I'll always add more in the summertime, just simply for evaporation and. Uh, and flow and especially the bigger plates as you're, you're doing the bigger plates so those are the two things you can adjust negative developer requires um it's, it's a different what you're doing you're trying to push development so you you add more restrainer and less iron positives you're trying to punch that image up and um, it's underexposed of course you're trying to pull that image up quickly have all the tonality and everything in it, but you're not making a negative. So negatives are less iron and more restrainer, so you can go longer. It's a different situation. So don't confuse those two. Um, uh, positives and negatives require very different um, developers. So I think that's about it for this one. I'm going to keep it kind of short. Again, I always want to uh, make sure you know that I have my books. Go grab my books. They're on Amazon. They'll help you out a lot. Keep watching the videos. Uh, let me know if you have any questions, concerns, or comments. I'm happy to answer them. And again, I hope you made something great for World Wet Plate Day. Honor Mr. Archer. Uh, be grateful that he did give that process to the world and invented that process, gave it to the world. Enjoy the rest of your day, and I will see you next week with something interesting, I hope. Have a good one. Thanks for watching. Yeah, yeah, yeah.